meeting now will have the Ignite format. How many of you are uh, uh, comfortable with the Ignite or know how it's... Okay, just a few. So I'll explain. Ignite is 20 slides. Every slide is 15, me uh, 15 seconds and they are auto-advanced. So every 15 seconds it will go to the next slide. All of them are packed here and we just aligned our speakers. So we have a total of 30 minutes for all the speakers to talk about DevOps and explain the lessons learned. So with that in mind, I'll invite the first Ignite speaker on the stage, please. And then Felix will help me with the logistics. Good afternoon, everyone. I think I get more than 15 seconds for this slide. <laughs> <coughs> Oh, <laughs> so, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Anoop, and I'm the product director for HP, Helion, and uh, I essentially manage all of the product management part. So I'll be talking about essentially two things. One is the business side of DevOps, and I'll also be talking about some of the things that we have implemented, some of the best practices that, uh, that we've done in our organization. Now, if you see all of these applications, I'm sure many of you have it in your phones now. You know, these applications are sexy, they're fun, they're all API based, and they're really cool. Now, if you look at a large organization, they would look at all of these apps and say, how am I gonna build all this stuff? There's no way. There's no way I can be as agile as them. There's no way I can do all of the stuff that they're doing. And this is the real question that large organizations are facing, including organizations like HP. And what's important to understand is, it's important to understand how the applications are built. You know, traditionally, we've always focused on silo way of building applications. Whereas the new way of building applications is all about scale out. It's all about microservices. And organizations need to manage both the traditional as well as the silo. And it's also important to understand what customers are looking for. You know, a lot of times, customers are looking for a continuous flow of new features. If you don't give them new features, and they'll probably get out and buy, get another application. And the other important aspect to understand is the fundamental architecture of building applications has changed. From monolithic three-tier architecture all the way to a cloud-native architecture where you're assuming infrastructure will fail. That's the primary assumption. So essentially it means that applications are complex. Vendors will come to you and say, I have 100 tools that can help you. But it's not about the tools. So it's really about changing your culture, changing your entire internal organization, and essentially building an integrated team to drive or to essentially go forward with the objectives that you have set for that team. That's the core essence of DevOps. And we've learned something. I'm from a sales team, but we've learned a lot of lessons. One is it's extremely important to hire the right talent, and it's extremely important to have a diverse team. Having the same set of uh, talent or engineers won't help. So hiring talent is very important, but what's also more important is gluing and keeping the talent together, or else they'll probably leave after a couple of months. Having a culture, this is the culture that we've set in our team, but having a culture that glues all of them together is extremely important for a team to be functional. And third most important thing is understand what your customers want. You know, I can't go out and sell a tool to a customer. It's important for me to work with the customer, to do a hackathon with the customer, understand their business problem, and then solve their solutions with the customer. So what does DevOps mean to HP IT? For HP IT, DevOps is a verb. You know, it's something that we do. It's not something that it's just created out of nowhere. And one of the most important things to also understand is, when you talk to different entities within the group itself, when you talk to the business owners, when you talk to QA, when you talk to the engineering, everyone has a different viewpoint of what DevOps is, but ultimately it all connects to the customer. A customer is at the core of what we do. And for HP, for instance, uh, DevOps is all about integrating everything together. Like for us in our organization, we've even bought the sales teams, the marketing teams, as part of the DevOps team, because you, know, you need to sort of connect to the customers. Some of the devops -y concepts that we have uh, may look a little strange, but one is we are assuming that a VP should be able to fix any issues in the production environment. If not, you're not achieving the objective of being simple. Second, like I mentioned earlier, you're assuming infrastructure will fail. 
you have to build applications with the assumption that your hardware will fail. So if it fails, your application has to be resilient to be able to run in spite of the failure. Third is monitor, monitor, monitor. Monitor everything, both from an R&D perspective as well as a sales perspective. Connect all of it using analytic tools and then give the scorecard for the decision maker to make decision on the spot. That is extremely important. And last, I think you're all familiar with this, which is inflict chaos in every production environment. Now, while the executives may not like it, this is the real way of sort of driving DevOps within an organization. So what's really important, and the reason I bought executives is important, what's really important is to build that small team who are ready to collaborate and change, but also what's very, very important is executive sponsorship. You don't have executive sponsorship, forget DevOps. It's never gonna happen, right? So the whole objective is change the thinking. If you change your thinking from here to here, then that's how you do DevOps. So start small, do a minimum viable product, and essentially go and do the DevOps way. So with that, I think uh, five minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much. How's everybody feeling? Well, after lunch is really tough. Hands up if you guys had a good lunch. Hands up, yeah, good? Awesome. Now, I think we're all excited. Mine is slightly different. I don't do uh, tech sites. So I'm gonna ask you, for the next five minutes for the conversation, do not look or touch your phone. Why? Because in today's increasingly tech-focused society, hyper-connected world, there seems to be one thing that we constantly overlook, the human being, the individual that looks back at us at the mirror, the man and the woman who's sitting beside you, who has a story they would like to share, and a connection they really would like to have. Now, in our drive to scale, drive to be more connected, and our drive to be more agile, more lean, sometimes our connections can be kind of, if I could say it, artificial, right? It's not, we don't really connect, we don't get to depth that we really want to. Now, don't get me wrong, a lot of us see that this is an issue. That's why we're trying to create environments where it's open, where we would connect one-on-one, -on -one, open concept. Yet, if you still look at it, we're still plugged in to our little world, zoned in to that machine. We see that. Don't get me wrong here, I love technology and it's beautiful. It allows me to connect globally. I can coach a client in South Africa, then into New Zealand, then talk to my mother in Canada, while I live here in Singapore. So technology is powerful and wonderful. The question is, when you don't really connect, who do you get to see? You see bright eyes, big smile, beautiful photos on the beach, but is that the real person? Or is that an avatar? Something that's curated, that we curate ourselves because we don't want to expose ourselves at the same time as someone who has sadness, who is lonely, and a lot of us don't even want to look at it. A study by a university in Michigan, where 14,000 respondents had shown over the last 30 years, college students today have 40% less empathy than those in the 1970s and 80s. Why? Because I believe technology locks us out. It actually keeps us from really connecting deeply, although it connects us a lot wide, but not in depth. Let's use a simple example, the humble phone. The phone was designed for us to have real-time connections here, right now. But how many people actually call? How many of us text, swipe, message, all sorts instead? Let me ask you this. Hands up if you ever had this kind of situation before. Hands up, come on, this is very common, right? And how times is this actually excruciatingly frustrating when it's the same person over and over? So when you say five minutes, or five o'clock, sorry, you know that you're gonna show up at six, and actually at 5.55 you text, are you there yet, are you there yet? Why? Because we don't actually face the reality of the individual beside us, or the person in front of us. We don't see the emotions, we don't see the heartache, the sadness, the voice, the tone. We get a few text messages, a few letters. We're distant. Technology can actually usurp real connections. When you're actually having a chance to talk to your child, your family in front of you, that phone constantly buzzes when you pick it up. Hi, Mr. Nigerian Prince. No, I'm not interested today. For some reason, that happens a lot. We don't get connected. Now, you and I and all of us can make a change. That's why we're here, right? We're getting back into connecting in real time with each other, right? These guys are pioneers and champions today in doing that. Even the king of technology, Mr. Steve Jobs knew this. When he tried to get Pixar to be more creative, innovative, and collaborative, he asked that there's only one toilet in the center. Why? So that everyone from different departments would actually have to see each other. One of the directors said, eye contact was critical to development and evolution. 
So think of that. Start with yourself as an individual. When you talk to somebody, actually talk to them, listen to them. Don't get stuck into your phone, don't get distracted. Don't get pinged by Facebook message or whatever. Find opportunities to actually connect. Right? Use technology not as a crux, but as a tool to get to know each other more, to really innovate, to be more collaborative, create that culture that you want to. That's what DevOps is all about, right? And the great thing is, if you have coffee chats, you can become a local superstar because you'll be able to see an insight that you never thought possible when you just text, message, or you try to move along very quickly. Enjoy the process, I ask, because you're going to see that it's going to be so much fun as you connect deeper and you learn a whole lot more. Right? So before I end off, I just want to kind of ask one more challenge for you guys. For the next 30 days, when you meet people, when you interact, when you're doing business, actually pay attention to the person beside you. If you get distracted, put your phone away. Find a way to stack your phone. Do whatever you need to do to connect back into the person in front of you. That's the power of personal influence. It takes one step, one action only. That's how these guys got started over a meetup group to amazing conference today. And I think you guys can do that in New York. Uh, business and industry as well. My name is Kimball Engio. I'm a business influence coach. I focus on empathy to drive performance and let me ask you, how many people actually succeeded in the challenge not looking at their phone in the last five minutes? Awesome, thank you. And um, basically, remember the days when you know um, I was the one developer for one project, and that was it. You know, you do everything from designing to production to support and everything. You know, nowadays you have more across. And what I'm going to tell you are the mistakes that my team went through when we moved to Agile. And I hope to provide you with a few tips and tricks so that you can avoid making the same mistakes. Right. And Agile is for complex, sorry Agile, uh, Scrum is for complex system. And um, what that means is that most companies start off with the simple traditional methods and only when the organization and basically the product becomes complex and only they move to Scrum. And it's a very intensive process, make no mistake. You know, increasing productivity and means some more stressful environment and which is why it's important to make Agile a habit and not a chore. Think of Agile as developing a habit, right? Repetition makes for familiarity, and um, as Malcolm Gladwell says, it takes 10,000 hours to become an expert in anything. Doesn't matter if it's walking or writing you know, or practicing a jump. If you do it often enough, it becomes a habit. First off, automate as much as possible. You know, Automate the build process, the testing process, anything that can get automated, invest in it. Spend some time and effort automating it, and the end results will pay off tremendously. Right? There's no need to explain everything. You know, people can Google Agile, Scrum, or Kanban. You know, just make sure that there is somebody, a team that you can approach when there is a question, and set them up, set them up with training or um, courses if necessary. And, but do not start explaining things in sprint planning or stand-ups. You'll be undermining the scope of these artifacts. Note down the questions, answer them later if you want, but it's very important to keep the meeting you know, for their intended purpose. It takes 21 days to cultivate the habit. This is actually a myth, and yeah. But what is not a myth is that it takes 21 days for a human being to get used to something. After plastic surgery, for example, you know, it takes 21 days for a person to get used to their own face. Right? And what that means is that don't ask for feedback in the first 21 days. You won't, there's no point in when you won't get a proper reflection. And um, by probing the temperature too soon, you're actually putting unnecessary pressure on your team. So trust your team to do the work. Moving to Agile is like kicking a teenager out of the house, you know, having them fly the coat. Managers le need to learn how to give up control, and the employees need to learn not to rely on instructions. It means moving from factory mode to talent commodity, right? Let your team's time and space to um, find their best productivity. And these are actually very realistic expectations. The only sure way to learn is to fall first. Consistency is important. Change is very jarring at best of times. So the only way to get used to change is to make sure that the new changes are as consistent as possible. Do not try to change things before your team has a chance to get used to the new changes. Don't try to fix everything. You know, accept this as ultimate fact. There will always be something to fix. 
regardless of how perfectly we have implemented Scrum or how long we have been practicing Agile, the whole idea is to make ourselves adaptable to change, right? Read your problems, tackle them systematically, and once you have accepted the fact that you can't face, you can't fix everything, then and only then you have started off on your Agile journey. Be patient with change, don't push it too fast. It's very hard to let things play out, right? And um, sometimes it's necessary, but you know, that's how it is. You can't force progress. You know, only take on what you can completely tackle and don't worry, steady as steady goes, you'll get there eventually. Agile is not a team, it's an organization structure made up of a lot of small teams. The common mistake is that you make each department a team. And basically, that immediately creates a situation that uh, impedes productivity with your large teams, right? Break it up, create two or three more teams or however many teams necessary. This is proven human behavior science, right? The recommended team size of three to nine people a team is actually set up for maximum productivity. Don't break what is meant to be the fix. Most importantly, be agile, improve and adapt, always review and change. There is no such thing as perfection, and what works today may not be appropriate tomorrow. To put Brad Pitt in Moneyball, adapt or die. Doesn't matter if you're a developer or a tester or an assistant or whoever, or even manager. Make sure, make the system work for you. This is actually an opportunity for you to you know, change your work environment, change things so that it's yours. You know, have fun doing it. Embrace, embrace change, embrace agile, you know, create your own little haven. Right. And um, Buddhist teaching tells us that, you know, when there's a conflict, there's a life lesson to be learned. Right? So take this chance to learn your lesson before moving on to something else. And to end it all, be patient, learn and evolve, and don't give up. Go do. Okay, good afternoon. So this is like some of the other topics that we've had this afternoon. This one's going to be a little bit different. I'm not going to be talking about the technical side about DevOps. I'm going to be talking about the business side of DevOps. How do you structure a continuous flow of change without a project? So this is a concept that is hard to explain in a few cases. Projects are so ingrained into the way that we work that it seems impossible that we can't work in that form. But here's the thing. Projects come to an end. A product doesn't. Products are something that you create that have a continuous life. We are trying to create a concept, a creation, something that has value for our customers. And value is the key point here. A project ends, does the value stop? No. So let's talk about an idea. This is something that we call no projects. This is a delivery model, okay, aligning with DevOps and Agile and Lean Startup and those sort of practice, which gives us a means to deliver a continuous flow of change into an environment that we control, that our finance teams fund, that our development and our maintenance teams collaborate on and produce an object, a product of value. Now, everyone here is in a software context? Most of you? Yes? So we're talking about software, software products. Right? But let's take a step beyond the product. Let's talk about outcomes. And outcomes is the key point here. Even the product itself is artificial. The outcome is what we're trying to achieve as a business. The outcome might be something as simple as we're trying to achieve 50% revenue growth. We're trying to increase staff satisfaction. We're trying to decrease the cost of deploying to our production environments. It doesn't matter what the outcome is, as long as you know what those outcomes are. Once you know the outcomes, once you've sat down as an organization and defined, here are the 10 outcomes that we're going to focus on for the next six months. We're going to create teams around them. And those teams are functional. They are structural. That is how your organization is structured to deliver continuous change. We call them deliver value delivery teams. These teams are who you are. Functional capability sits alongside. But let's now talk about a different side. 
Okay? We've created these outcome teams. Now, let's say, for example, our outcome is we want to increase our user base by 20% over the next six months. Okay? How are we going to do that? We're going to create a team. This team, your job, okay? you five people at the frontier, your job is to create a team, is to create a, a, a product or update the product to meet the outcome. And so we're going to do that through the activity canvas. The activity canvas gives us the means in which we can plan and track and deliver a series of continuous linked changes into a production environment without raising a project, without having to go to finance and ask for a million dollars to run the next upgrade project. Right? But inside the activity canvas, and I'm, just, I'm, I'm one step behind, inside the activity canvas we break these down into four quadrants. Things which are high value but low effort, that's what we do first. Things which are low value and high effort we do last. But this is where the value axis is the critical one. Because value is what we're trying to deliver. Who here writes software for fun? Hands up. All right. Who here gets paid by their company to write software for fun? You all should have your hands down because you're paid by your company to write software to make money. Okay? Except maybe you seem to be quite lucky. Okay? Your, company is in, your company is in the business of delivering value to your clients through a product. That value remains regardless of whether there's a project to deliver it. Right? We are all, well I'm not, not anymore, I haven't been for 10 years, but most of us here are software developers or in some way integrated into the delivery process. Right? We know that there's a technology stack behind it. The technology stack is irrelevant. What we're trying to achieve is delivering value. Delivering value continuously through a product or a suite of products that are important and we need a structure. We need a way to treat everything as a change and to bring everything into production as a valuable object. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jason Mann. Uh, I'm from Forest Technologies. Um, we're a DevOps and continuous delivery uh, consultancy. We implement our solutions globally around the world. Uh, today I'm here to talk about how you should uh, crawl before you run when implementing DevOps. Uh, recently Gartner had a, a new report come out uh, that said in 2015 $2.3 billion was spent on uh, DevOps tools. 2016 is not going to change. 25% of all global 2000 organizations are going to be adopting this practice. Yeah. We're seeing demand increase now for more changes at a faster rate. We've got more competition from our vendors. You know, We can change very easily. DevOps is seen as a mechanism to allow us to really achieve this. DevOps is being marketed as our, our pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. <coughs> our unicorn companies and our, our startups have already proven this and, and achieved this. The right process here is being able to adopt to it at the right time. Start looking at our people. You know, we want to start unify, uh, unifying our processes together so that we remove our barriers and, and um, be able to uh, ensure a more collaborative behavior. We've got our different processes now. We want to increase our efficiency. We have to optimize uh, all, all of this and, and use automation to bring this together. We're able to see then using all our different tools. All our tools out there, there's so many tools out there. There's no one tool for out of the box for every single company. You need to start harnessing your partners and your peers to understand their success, their success stories. Know what they're doing right. Most importantly here, you want to start small, think big, aim for Nirvana. Yeah, we've got different items of automation, continuous integration, continuous deployment, infrastructure automation. Start automating this set first. Typically when people un uh, undertake DevOps transformation, there's two real methods. Backporting DevOps, legacy applications that can't be rewritten, replaced. Yeah, we look at automating that to get to our continuous delivery pipeline. 
Alternatively, people look at the brave new world. Containers, microservices, you know, where we're able to break up our application and be able to deliver this in small chunks in very fast movements. Then we look at our metrics, before and after. You do not want to be steering blindly. You need to know what you're achieving. Be able to measure your success, what you're doing well, what you're doing bad. You know, more importantly, be able to iterate through those bad things. Our typical DevOps uh, metrics include how quickly you deploy, how often our requirements go into production, how often do you fail, which you will, and when you fail, how quickly can we recover from that? Our first item of automation looks at continuous integration. Our developers build, how quickly are we ready to do our deployments? Uh, CI is probably the most mature of the DevOps practices as, as Agile starts using it. Continuous delivery is where we start looking at how we consistently deploy our applications across all our environments. This is where dev and ops really come together, unifying their processes so that we deliver exactly the same every single environment. Infrastructure automation. This is where you know, we've got something to deploy, but what are we actually deploying on? How can we be sure that we've got the right patches or the right versions installed onto our infrastructure? You know, there's tools out there that allow you to do this. We also look at cultural transformation. You know. You've got to have your attitudes, your values, your goals aligned all in the same direction to really allow you to bring a, a, a trust into your organization. Everyone needs to do that. Then we look at continuous improvement. You're going to fail, no doubt about that. But it's how you take on these failures and turn it into a success. Iterate through uh, these and be able to change to give yourself a success. So really to recap here, we're kind of looking at our, our people, our process, our tools. You know, tools underpin these processes. Identify where you want to start from. Start small, aim for nirvana. Be able to get to where your endpoint is. We want to start from bottom up. Create our islands of automation and be able to join them all up together using continuous integration, continuous delivery, infrastructure automation. Thank you very much. My name's Jason, where we've got a booth outside for any questions. Wow, there's a lot of you. I'll stand over here so you can see the screen. Um, so my name's Ovent, Oven Roti. Uh, I have a few apologies to make. First, for my name, you can laugh if you want to. Um, just think of Roti Prata uh, and, uh, and you'll see me. The other one is, uh, I've never done one of these Ignite talks before, so uh, you know, really, really well done for the previous ones. I'm not going to be able to follow up. Thirdly, I'm going to do something really basic. I'm going to talk about uh, some technology and I'm going to talk about uh, packaging, so it's going to be pretty boring. So why should you care about this uh, talk? Well, there are three things. Uh, if you want to reduce your boot time, increase reliability, and reduce dependency on third parties, then I'll talk about that, nothing else. So hopefully in five minutes we can, we can get through that. I'll also talk about a lot of tools, a lot of open source tools, all of them open source tools. So I'm actually gonna go in and, and look at how you're actually gonna use those tools uh, as opposed to just complaining about uh, how awful they are. So this is very, very simple. Let's go back to basics. Um, if you are deploying an image into production today, whether you're using virtual machines or you're using Docker containers, you're facing a choice. You're facing a choice between a base OS image with only the operating system on it, and then you dynamically put everything else on using configuration management tools, or you have an immutable image where you're basically building everything into the image and deploy that image by itself. And in between, I've called it a foundation image, which has some of the two. So what are the things that I think you should consider for these images? The first one is installation speed. The second one is reliability of remote repository. So from an installation speed perspective, if you install everything dynamically, it can take 10, 15, 30 minutes to deploy a single image. What's the rate of change of the software that you're going to install? And finally, what's the security mandate? Do you have to install an intrusion detection system on every single image, for example? What about an immutable image? If you're going for the immutable image uh, uh, end of the spectrum, then you really have to think about secrets. How are you going to embed any secret keys or API keys? 
how are you going to eliminate conflict? Uh, well, this also helps you to eliminate conflict drift, where immutable images ensures that all images that you deploy are exactly the same as the other. But on the other hand, if you use immutable images, it means that you have to update the image for every single change that you do. So this is a pretty complicated slide, but one solution, and I'll give you the link for the solution in the GitHub repo with all the code later on, is to use tools that developers already know and love, like Jenkins. So you define your jobs of Jenkins leader that pulls a repo, for example, a Git repo. The repo has the configuration script as well as a template for Packer. Packer is a building tool that's open source as well. And those templates can target to Docker containers, to Google Cloud, to Amazon Web Services, Open uh, OpenStack, etc. <coughs> Oops. Um, nobody noticed that one at all. Um, Swarm client, Swarm is a plugin for Jenkins that then pulls from the Jenkins leader into the build agent and then pushes it, these images, to the final destination. Now, in 30 seconds, I went through something that will take you about two hours to actually set up. Uh, but all the code, I'll give you the link uh, afterwards, afterwards in there. But some of the beauty of this is that you're using the same development tools that you do for pushing code to actually deploying images as well. So for the automated, uh, this automated image builder pipeline, you basically see um, the output being either, uh, in this case, a Google Container Registry or a Compute Engine VM. But it could be OpenStack or uh, Amazon Web Services or anything else you want. Also, inside Jenkins, you just use Jenkins the way that you're used to. All of these are either Jenkins plugins, or you put in the configuration script yourself. And Jenkins also allows you to back up so that you can recover to an older version of the image. Everyone loves containers today, so why don't we also put this automated pipeline system in containers by itself? So this is a setup, and again, I'll show you the GitHub code in a moment, where you actually run this system in containers as well. Uh, we're using Kubernetes, which is open source, uh, and you can see here that we have replication controllers running to always keep it running so that it's highly available by itself. Okay. You can see that this five minute thing uh, presentation is, uh, is proving pretty hard. Okay, here we go. So we've got all of these cool tools, all of these are open source tools, and this pipeline you can use to run on any cloud that you want, or bare metal. So by putting these things together that many of your developers already know, you can actually put something that is pretty open and easy to use once you've set it up, okay? Even though it looks a bit scary up, uh, up front. So why should you care? Well, this will help you to reduce boot time, increase reliability, and also reduce dependency on third parties when you're dynamically building images. And fantastic. Right on cue. Um, QR code, I don't know how long it's going to be uh, held up, maybe 15 seconds. You can Google it, just do containers, Kubernetes, Docker, Packer in the same line, and you'll get to the solution. My email is roti at google.com. Just think of roti prata. Just don't do roti prata at google.com. Thank you very much.